warm welcome to this episode of uh, the Releasing the Real You show. If you haven't watched previous shows, go and do it now. Um, but I'm really excited about our show today because I have my good friend Lisa Violini here with me. And Lisa is a um, Mediterranean with a bit more of an Italian take on cooking. And she teaches people to get the love back into cooking. So we're going to talk all about food today. So I'm really excited about that because who doesn't like food? Um, so welcome, Lisa. Thanks for Thank being you, a guest. Thank you for inviting me on your channel. Good. And tell me a little bit about what you do and how, more importantly, how you got started. Okay. So I, yes. Yeah, so as you kind of alluded to, I help people learn how to cook primarily Italian food, but kind of Mediterranean style, because we all know that's one of the healthiest diets in the world, apparently. Um, and how did I start? I started in lockdown, having, well, having come to the end of a contract or a contract that was ending in the kind of nine to five corporate world, which I wasn't in love with anymore. I'd always harbored a passion to do something with food because it's just in my blood. My family's always had some sort of restaurant or cafe, or it's just, just kind of inherent. But I knew I didn't want to go down that kind of more traditional food route. And so I just helping, well, came about in lockdown. I was helping fundraise for my choir who weren't able to meet and like all charities were struggling. So I did a couple of uh, cooking sessions with them online and and I was like hmm, all right might be on to something here and and it kind of started with that really and I've now been I'm now in my third year and mm -hmm. doing this online more face-to-face -face where possible okay so um you you mentioned you teach people how to cook um why do you think cooking is so important like what, how do you feel about it? Why is it really so important? I, I mean, mean, I'm a big believer that it's important, but. I, I'm also a big believer that it's important. I mean, and there's a number of reasons why it's important too, because cooking from scratch is generally healthier. It's cheaper. Um, and that's kind of two big ones there too. I mean, also joyous if you're cooking for a family and you're making nutritious food for them, um, you know, that's just a way of showing your love for me. Cooking is a, is a form of, of love. And I think there's, you know, the fundamental things are one, knowing what you're eating to trying to cook things um you know that are delicious and 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 making making it for yourself or other people because cooking for yourself is also a joyous thing um and then you have the health benefits of that and the cost save especially right now you know really who kind of you're lucky if you can be going out every night to eat or getting deliveries or you know and ready meals mm, yeah okay they're probably full of things you don't want to be eating on a day-to-day -day basis so it's a skill and it's an important one. And I think sadly, a lot of people just have lost the ability to to do it and they don't know where to start or, yeah. So cooking, if you can get back into it or, you know, find a way, do it. So do you, um, obviously you teach people how to cook, but you mentioned, um, you know, it, it is cheaper. And I do agree with that cooking from scratch is cheaper, even though people quite a lot of people say that, you know, healthy eating is expensive. Um, so do you help people to plan how to make their meals cheaper as well? I'm always able to give advice on that. Yeah, depending on what we're making, um, you know, some things, they're, they're going to be what they are and the ingredients are what they are. Soul, you know, yeah, <laughs> the, the king of all it, fish, let's face yeah. it, that's not, a, not something you can eat every day. But, you know, even things like making, um, I'm not going to call it a bolognese because it's not a bolognese for me, it's a ragu. Uh, so something like that, which is quite meat based, you know, you can you can add mushrooms in half the meat, lentils, half the meat. And, you know, it goes a lot further and you're still getting your, your kind of your protein and you won't taste the difference in flavour. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think mushrooms enhance the flavour of quite a lot of things. So there's always ways and I'd always give people tips and, you know, using frozen veg sometimes instead of fresh and um, 
tinned things although I'm, I'm not a fan I, tinned veg is good but I mean depending on what the veg is beans and and things like that yes, yeah I definitely. I would draw the line at tinned peas they're horrendous <laughs> but frozen peas are great I've always got a bag in in the fridge and yeah, I just throw it into everything um so yeah there are ways to make things even cheaper and um, cooking from scratch at home and, unless you're going all out on a big dinner and you want to splurge a bit obviously <laughs> yeah definitely so um how can people become a little bit more intentional when it comes to their cooking i mean i i you know yes cooking obviously is great cooking it can be fun um i i don't know you mentioned cooking for one is not you know you mentioned that as being fun i personally don't think it is but um you know it's um it's it's that we we can debate about that in a minute <laughs> Um, but how can one become more intentional with their cooking? Like so to me, being seasonal is super important, um, mostly because that's when those fruit and veg um, have the most vitamins and minerals in them because they are just being cut as opposed to being cool stored and, and losing a lot of their nutritional value. Um, going out and pick your own stuff, Growing your own, tell me what you think well, about it. Probably all of those things. I mean, probably growing your own is is a bit more tricky. One, not everybody has the space, and two, I mean, I have tried. I, I grow my tomatoes on my front drive. You do, you have, and I and they they were yeah. very good. The ones I had, but I have tried several times, but I have definitely struggled to inherit my parents' green fingers. So everything I try and grow doesn't grow particularly well. So. But I can cook whatever else everybody gives That's me. Not which true, is by good. the way, you have amazing figs. Uh, oh yeah, well they the they're a kind of the figs are doing their own thing. They're no, <laughs> no 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 none of my ability yeah. is making them grow. Um, but I'd say the seasonal thing, the foraging is a little bit more niche, and and there is a way. <laughs> I mean, you could probably look for depending on where you live as well, because you know if you've got access to a bit more green space, there might be more foraging opportunities. Yeah, but I mean, at the moment, like right now, the, uh, wild garlic. Wild garlic. Is, yeah, I was just going to say, I've got some in the fridge from uh, someone, a friend of mine, that picked them. So yeah. So that's kind of just coming out now and it'll be around probably for a month or so. Um, and I, it, you know, you can, if you're out walking, I mean, I've got a dog, so sometimes I'm out walking in, in different places and I have stumbled across wild garlic even up here in Barnet. So um, I do need to go and have a look if I can find some. But I think the foraging thing is probably a little bit more um, niche and you need to know what you're picking. <laughs> I mean, we do forage, my family forages for, for mushrooms in autumn but again that's a whole you need to know what you're picking so but the seasonal thing is probably a bit easier because like you said you kind of look for I mean it's very easy to to find out what's in season you can even just google search what's in season in April and you get a list of ingredients and then so when you're in the supermarket try and look for those try and look for things that are grown in in the UK so at the moment um I really like asparagus but I try not to eat them until they come into British season which mm -hmm. is also starting soon so I'll be probably buying a lot more asparagus in the next two months while it's in season rather than getting I think now at the minute they're all coming from Mexico or somewhere like that and I'm like really I don't I mean I like it but I'm not going to really go mad all year round trying to get hold of it um yeah so just and if you've got access I think they're really good places to find stuff um a local food I'm not talking a kind of farmer's market yeah but they're quite expensive but there's some sometimes just your local market on a whatever day of the week it is there's a great one if anyone lives near Barnet in North London on a Wednesday and a Saturday they've got two fruit and vegetables there one usually has a bit more bulk you can buy like lots of tomatoes and things in bulk the other one's a bit more mm. uh, uh, traditional and they had some last week I was up there and I managed to get some blood oranges which are just coming to the end of their season and some um radicchio which is a is a, a really bright purple leaf not it's kind of not it's not a cabbage it's but it yeah. looks a bit like a, a like a red cab that's in season now and i can't find that in the supermarket they also had fennel quite cheaply but they'd run out mm. unfortunately so try and seek these things out and then yeah and and actually if you can't get hold of seasonal veg and you want to use veg vegetable again seek out frozen because they're picked and they're frozen at source usually so they retain nutrition yeah. uh, better than something that's been flown halfway across the, the world yeah 100 percent agree with that i mean I, I have a interesting i was at a friend of mine some years ago and she had a um a seasonal cookbook 
Uh, and so I couldn't find it anywhere. Found a copy on eBay. Um, and it's great because obviously it has all the, you know, recipes for the summer. Obviously, it's not by month by month, but is by season. Uh, and it it just makes a big difference because the, the amount of nutrients you have uh, and you get from your food is so much higher and than if you, you go for anything that's been, you know, cooled for months or, or been flown from, as you say, I can't remember what you say, Mexico, yeah. or, um, you know. Uh, it does because obviously those fruit and veg are being picked much earlier before they ripe. So they haven't developed all the goodness in them yet. And uh, we expecting them supposedly to develop it in tra- in transit, mm. um, but it doesn't at all. Um, so that's an interesting one. That is. Um, I mean, I but that we also are used to having access to much more produce now isn't it because if we had to really only eat what was grown in the uk in season oh it's quite narrow what we can get apples and pears the whole winter that's it yeah that's it and cabbages and and things like that which which you know don't get me wrong they're great and you can do a lot of them but that doesn't give us enough variety so i guess we just need to look a little bit beyond that too but it kind of again maybe getting stuff from europe which is less less far away than um, probably these days more expensive I mean, about more expensive <laughs> and, and, and harder to come by we all saw the yeah. uh, the tomato shortage a few weeks ago in supermarkets so yeah it's tricky times at the moment but um, I'd say try and incorporate more stuff that's grown locally and keep the stuff that isn't as as additional things so have them but maybe try not to make them the mainstay of what you're buying on a weekly basis i bought celeriac the other day which i haven't cooked with in ages so i I made a great celeriac uh, soup actually she sent me the recipe not that long ago i haven't made it yet but yeah so that's a kind of underrated root vegetable so i turned it into a, a a puree then I added it, the, what I had left into a minestrone, because that's one of those soups you can throw everything that you've got left into. <laughs> so, yeah, just pick up a vegetable maybe you've never tried before. Do a bit of research on how you can cook it and, and have a go. Just experiment. Yep, that sounds good. Um, So when you, I mean, when we all think of Italian food, we generally think about pizza and pasta. Uh, and, uh, oh, my God, carp fest at its best uh and uh italian food is not healthy at all um that's what most people think i mean i know lots of people that are on a diet and say i'll I'll go anywhere but not to an italian uh restaurant probably mostly because uh lots of italian restaurants have mostly pasta and pizza yeah Um, so um how does one combine italian food with health uh and not having or not being on a carb overload. What what's your? I mean, I see your posts on uh, Insta uh, quite regularly, and I do see a lot of pasta in your meals, but obviously, very small portion of it with lots of other stuff. So tell me a little bit more about how you feel about Italian food and and nutrition, health, etc. Yeah, uh, it, that is a tricky one because maybe less so now but it, it depending on where you are in Italy as well pasta is their mainstay it's a bit like rice in 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 Asian cuisine and you know that's the that's their base of a lot of their dishes so but saying that when you actually go to Italy you don't I mean just on a note you don't see the level of maybe obesity that you see over here and they are still eating pasta as mainly their main one of their Maybe once a day, even they'll have pasta in Italy uh, or in northern Italy, they'll have risottos and and polenta a bit more as as well. So I think there's got to be something in it because they don't seem to have a problem over there. I think so. One of the things is um, the portion size. They probably don't have heaps of it and the sources they have with pasta because pasta itself. Yes, it's a carb. But if you if you make that and avoid the probably creamy cheesy sauces and I very rarely I mean I might do a carbonara every now and then but generally if I'm making pasta my sauce is a vegetable base so they're tomato some sort of vegetable broccoli work really well with pasta olive oil which is a good fat um, parmigiano cheese which is a cheese but actually on the cheese scale it's one of the best ones you can have Um, it becomes more or less lactose free which I only learned not that long ago because of the way it's made um so it's probably and, and probably doesn't have that much saturated fat in it. So 
I think there's an element of it's not about necessarily the pasta, but it's about what you're combining with the pasta. Yeah. Um, the pizza thing is a bit different. And I don't think people eat pizzas every day in Italy. You will go and have a pizza with friends. You know, most people don't make them at home. They'll just go to their nearest pizzeria. And again, yeah, what are you putting on top of your pizza? You could have it without the cheese and have, I quite often have a vegetariana or an ortelana, which is just loaded with vegetables usually a big side salad that we split between whoever I'm eating the pizza with. So, and again, olive oil. Um, so I think they do eat a bit more mindfully there. And I, and I said, that's, you know, that's only one meal. A lot of the time they are just having salads for lunch with tuna or, or beans or, you know, the stuff that they can get. If you'll buy a coastline fish, you're going to be eating a lot of fresh fish, fish that again, we don't necessarily get here. Anchovies, sardines are eating a lot there, sea bass, sea bream. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of is a bit one dimensional when you say pasta and pizza or that, that the bulk of an Italian diet, it's not really. Mm. And the way they eat pasta is maybe a bit different than we eat it here as well. That's so. very interesting. So yeah, that's how you can be, you know, you can eat Italian food every day without uh, putting on a lot of weight. Mm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'd, 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 Italian desserts are a different <laughs> thing altogether. Well, when we talk about tiramisu or yeah. others, you know, definitely. <laughs> but then that's any dessert in general anyway. Yeah. So it's not just about Italian desserts. No, it's not. And they are delicious. But again, it's not, I just don't think they eat like that every day, really. Yeah. So would a, would a dessert be like something they would have once a week, let's say, when the family comes Probably, together? Probably, yeah. A bit like here when you might have a family over and do a traditional roast on a Sunday, you'd probably save the desserts. It's quite common in Italy at the weekend to go to a patisserie and buy trays of these delicious little made, um, you know, filled with creams and stuff like that. And if you're going somewhere, you would bring them along as, as your kind of your part of the meal. So that's quite a common thing. Um, fruit again they'll eat a lot of fruit um, instead of you know having dinner and they'll have a piece of fruit afterwards so you're not there's nothing I mean all right there's the sugar levels in fruit but that's a different conversation and only a problem if you're maybe pre-diabetic um, or diabetic so yeah they eat a lot of fruit as well okay that's very very interesting yeah so myths of Italian cooking being bad we not just so bad eating. yeah <laughs> So what are your top three tips for cooking um, that you could share with, with the audience today? But, you know, what are your top three tips? OK, so I'd say don't overwhelm yourself. If you're if you're not a particularly good cook and you want to start cooking more, keep it simple. So try not to find find recipes that are easy to make within maybe half an hour don't have a overwhelm of ingredients most italian food is simple you have maybe four or five ingredients there's probably some garlic some olive oil some vegetables of some sort a meat a pasta so you don't need to go mad with like cupboards full of stuff that you're never going to use one thing um, i've seen with italian cooking is like the base or the start is always the same yeah um, so that makes it already uh, more accessible. The same with the soup. You've got your sofrito. Exactly. Uh, a lot of sauces start with that kind of combo yeah. of, of celery, carrot and onion. It's the kind of foundation of a lot of, of Italian cooking, actually. Um, so, yeah, keep it simple. Um, don't be afraid to just try something new. Um, try and plan your meals a little bit. I'm not saying if it's if it's overwhelming to plan for seven days, um, plan for three days and see how you get on and then you know where we were talking about people don't like cooking just for one person if you plan your meals and cook you've maybe got something you can throw in the freezer for another day or have for lunch the next day so you're cooking it for two really but eating it twice <laughs> yourself so that's another tip just to kind of and that also avoids food waste um, yeah and just just try and treat cooking a bit like a bit of you time so you know people get frustrated in the kitchen but you know if that's that half that maybe 15 minutes where you're prepping and you're chopping vegetables it can be quite mindful you're doing something and you're you know just think about what you're doing and, and use it as a form of self-care as well just for that half an hour and what you're feeding yourself is so important really so mm -hmm. don't dismiss it as something that's oh god it's another thing I've just got to do today try and turn it into something that's a bit of you time, whether you're cooking for yourself or a family. Yeah, I often see 
um, parents of, especially with small kids that, you know, prepare really healthy food for the kids and then yes. they just, um, you know, do whatever for themselves. And, and I often say, well, why would your kid eat better than you? And they're like, oh, yeah, interesting. That's really common place, actually. And actually on the kids front, get them involved. So if you're making something that, you know, we go back to the to the that sofrito thing, get, get them to start. If they can't chop with a knife, get them to grate the vegetables because the more they start understanding where their food comes from at an early age, the more invested they're going to be as they grow older as well. So whilst it seems, again, it's that whole dinner time chore, get them involved say right part of what we're doing today is you're going to help me prepare dinner yeah definitely yeah and that makes it more enjoyable as well I mean I know my mom um you know when she was cooking she she's she's quite a good cook um but she doesn't enjoy it Mm. um and for her it was very important for us to sit in the kitchen so I learned a hell of a lot just by watching her um so she wasn't on her own in the kitchen could we help? Yeah, certain things we definitely could help with. Um, as you say, you know, um, I don't know, uh, grating some of the, um, you know, runner beans or, or those kind of stuff. Hmm. I remember sitting and... Chopping and tailing. Uh, <laughs> chopping and tailing, but also yeah. using this uh, these uh, this grater, which was a manual grater before we had the food processor um, and, and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely uh something to do with with kids and it, it gives them the tools as well later on um to to try and uh be experimental in the kitchen yeah for sure um so that's a very important one yeah so thanks for sharing so i know you do one to one cooking lessons um in person or via zoom as well yeah i can do yeah. it but depending on where the person's based yes i could do one to one sessions um I do uh, small group classes in person, but that's obviously quite localised to to North London. Uh, And if I can also do small groups at people's houses. So if they want to get a group of friends together or family, um, I can come along, devise a menu and we can I can show you how to cook it. You get involved and then you all eat together at the end, which is also for me a massive part of the food thing. It's the coming together and the eating around a table, chatting. And that's. Which is something as family, I think um, lots of family have forgotten that bit. Like we do it when we have friends over, but we don't always do it with family. And I think that's a a very, very important one. Um, Yeah. And I I know it's not always going to be possible every day of the week, but the days where you can, I think that's really another really important um, part of the whole food journey and and (laughs) process. Yeah. And then you do workshops where you yes. teach people, especially pasta workshops. Yeah. Pasta is yeah. one of my, uh, my my kind of signature classes. I teach, uh, and then I can, yeah, kind of whatever, really. I quite like doing the bespoke things. So if someone comes to me with a, I'd really like to learn how to make this. And I'm like, OK, got it. So that's that's quite a nice. And they are all tailored um, to people's requirements as well. And I can obviously adapt dietary and nutritional um, things too, if, if needs be. Yeah. Definitely. And I, I know you also do like I do um, after school or or after uh, cookery clubs for children or parents and children. So um, the more people know how to cook, the healthier we all will be, hopefully. Indeed. And that's it, isn't it? It's about imparting that knowledge. And if you can spark someone's interest somewhere, then it's one person more that we're helping <laughs> to uh-huh. cook for. 100 percent so if people want to get hold of you where are you more active i mean all your details will be in the comments um in the description of this episode but is it mostly facebook is it mostly uh, instagram or other places website yes so all of those places so i'm, I'm on instagram i'm on facebook i have got a website and my um my business name is Nolita Cooks, so you can probably search me and find me on Google as well. I do, I do come up apparently. <laughs> oh, so uh, it's K N for those. It's a K N, yes, K N. Yeah. It's a bit of a strange spelling, but yeah, that's and that's. Where me. does that name come from? Ah, uh, okay. So when I was thinking of my brand name, I was a bit like, oh, I don't really know what to call myself. So. Yeah, it was it was kind of something I, I made up, but it does have a meaning. So the, the kind of the, the K is for knowledge and the no liter bit is is kind of an abbreviation of North London Italian. 
which is a bit my heritage. And actually that came from, in New York, there's a area called North of Little Italy, which is called Nolita. So it was me stealing that idea really (laughs) and using it (laughs) in a different way. There we go. It's it's a bit of a fun thing really, but that's Mm -hmm. how my name came about. Fantastic. See, I, I didn't know that. So uh, <laughs> I learned something today as well. There we so, go. Uh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being a fantastic guest. We all like to talk about food. So um, it's always good to have a foodie on board. Well, yes. by the way, before we say goodbye, what's your favorite uh, dish to cook and to eat? Mm. So many, but I still think I just get a real joy out of making pasta from scratch and then depending on what pasta I'm making the sauce accompanies that so um, one I find it quite therapeutic and two yeah once you start getting into making fresh pasta there's no going back to buying a pack of ravioli in a shop it, you just can't do it so uh, mm-hmm. yes that for me and then probably second to that would be something like a really good I don't know, like a salt in bocca or something like that. So it's a it's a thin slice of either well veal traditionally with a bit of parma ham on top, sautéed in mars in butter and oil and, and marsala. It, it's delicious if it's made well. Yes, very good. Yeah, well, I'm not so much into my own pasta making because <laughs> I, I I I don't, but uh, don't have a pasta very often anyway but I'm definitely into my own pizza making. Yes. Uh, which I started learning with you and then yes, I okay. kind of evolved over time um, to uh, probably takes much more time than the workshop that we did together. Um, but obviously uh, we all know that when you ferment something for much longer, which w- with way less yeast, um, it develops much more flavor as well. So yeah, it's probably better for you as well. So it's slowly yeah, fermented. Yeah. 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 Pizzas are great. I mean, yeah. Again, that's a that's a treat once in a while. A little bit like you said, I don't like the word treat, but um, it's a meal once in a while. Generally, when my nieces come uh, for a sleepover, and uh, we make pizza together. Again, it's a great one to make with kids. Yeah. Even if you haven't got the time to make the dough, you could do it. It really simply and cheating using like pita breads and just getting them to top and putting them under the grill. You know, it's just a quick and easy, fun way to get them to make their own dinner <laughs> definitely I mean they love it and uh, I always get smiley faces on the pizza between the olives and the cheese and the stuff and it's all good fun so, indeed well thank fantastic. you for having me Anne thank you for being a fabulous guest and uh, whoever hasn't subscribed yet to the channel please go and do it so you get updated on the upcoming uh, episodes and I will see you all on the next one Bye for now.